It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio, flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome on Facebook and Instagram at The Mike Novak Show and at Mike Now on Twitter. Good planets are hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. And true currents and thriving seas. Wind blowing through breathing trees. Strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Nova. Good planets are in the main. Right. Just keep dancing. That's all we do here. It's uh, yeah, tap dancing. Why? Why is it that the my 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 heart rate is uh, about three hundred right now? I don't know what it is about what happens just before every show. <laughs> every show. Hey, thanks, Rick DeMaio. Just sent us you know seventeen photos. Hey, you want to use these in the show? Well, yeah. Um, thanks. Send those along too. Wow. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Good morning. It's, the, uh, the good news is it's not raining. Um, now see, and how things change. We go from complaining about no rain and having drought mm-hmm. and then four inches of rain falls in about an hour in Chicago. Uh, that's, we're going to see this and we, and we're having, by the way, special, Rick DeMaio, we've got bonus DeMaio today um, because a full uh, hour, a full hour, or well, close to a full hour. We may fool around a little bit, but because uh, uh, um, it, it, so much has been going on in weather, and not just here in Chicago. Yeah, but, we've got Ernest out in Oregon, in, in Oregon, saying good morning from freakishly hot. Portland, it is. Oregon. I mean, Oregon is nuts. Um, and that's what's a, causing this here. Apparently, Portland, and I don't know if it happened, is was uh, uh, possibly going to have 107 degrees. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, Seattle is supposed to get over 100. And by the way, Portland has hit 100 degrees exactly twice in its history. Uh, so um, that's how crazy it is uh, wow. out there. So. And, and- like I said, when I oh he says 115 today. What? 115? Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. Wow. Which is why we're getting the cool air and the rain, but right, that's exactly, for our exactly. But but heat. that comes with its own problems, obviously, uh, as we've discovered. Um, yesterday, uh, and I can t- talk about it when Rick is on, but you know, I'm at home and uh, this little baby goes off and says, hey, there's a tornado warning. You'd better get to your basement. So I'm, uh, and this is in the city of Chicago. Smack in, there were, there were sirens. North side. Sirens going off in Grant Park. Really? Downtown, yeah. I saw a video of it last night. Um, you just don't see that uh, mm-hmm. very often. And, and then I was watching the tube and watching the lines of thunderstorms and the possible mm-hmm. tornadoes and the watches and the warnings. And it was scary stuff. It was yeah. really scary stuff. So uh, I have to find Legata, who is uh, under the couch, because I'm not going into the basement without my kitty. And um, so I'm dragging her out from underneath the couch. And I say, okay, we're going to... We're, we're, <laughs> exactly. She's like <laughs> holding onto the carpet. <laughs> and um, uh, no, you got to come. So you know, we wrap her in, in, in the blanket so she doesn't start Aww. scratching me as... It, well, actually, it was a towel. And so she doesn't start scratching me as we're going in the basement. And we go down the basement and we get in the basement in time to watch the water come bubbling up from the drain in yeah. the basement. There's nothing because quite like that bloop, 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 bloop sound. Bloop. And it was coming up through the cracks 
in the basement as well. And I went, we can't stay here. Okay, come on, Legato, we're going back upstairs. And I wrapped her back in the towel and took her back upstairs. And I said, you know what? I'm going to deal with tornadoes up here Uh, because I'm not going to stand in in sewer water uh, (laughs) dealing with this. So, uh, but the good news, the good, and and the, the bad thing was, Last Sunday, when we had two inches of rain, the basement flooded. Mm-hmm. We didn't know it till the, uh, 24 hours later. Uh, and we went, <laughs> Kathleen went down there and go, uh, Mike, Michael, the, uh, the basement's flooded. So we called the router, router guy. He comes out on mm-hmm. Tuesday. He rides the thing on Tuesday. And on Saturday, it floods again. Um, but the good news is that the riding actually did some good. It, the sewers were just overwhelmed by four yeah. inches of rain. Because the minute the rain stopped, the basement drained. And so now I've got the dehumidifier down there and the fans, and it's pretty dried out yeah. at the moment. Yeah. So, and if there's a clog somewhere in the street line, it's often going to back up into your own basement. Yeah. And so my friends are writing and saying, hey, what about a sump pump? And I just laugh. I just laugh. Sump pump. What? What's that? Need a sump pit for a I, sump I, pump. I got, I got no place to. Yeah. I've been talking to Rod. Ron Cowgill about this for years, okay? Mm-hmm. And and I have to say, before we bring in our guest here, I've owned my home now for well, not quite 21 years. Uh, as for home ownership, the jury is still out, if you uh-huh. ask me. Uh, the jury is still out because it's well, uh, it's got its issues. And, yeah, and then you were on the phone with me this week, and I'm like, I've got water spurting backwards out of, out of my down exactly. entry as well. I'm like, the plumber's here. Got to go. Got to go. <laughs> there might be a chipmunk stuck in there. So uh, uh, got to go. And that 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 should take us to uh, our guest. I think that's a, a good a intro. Great transition. I, I know it. Dead chipmunks <laughs> in the gutters. Uh, and uh, with that in mind, let us uh, go to Nancy Lawson, the humane gardener. It is such a pleasure to have you on the show this morning, Nancy. Oh wait wait wait! And I forgot to turn her her mic on. So that would that would, fun. yeah. Let me uh, help you with that. I popped it off before be, while we were getting ready. Well, in the mad cap five minutes before the show starts. Good morning, Nancy. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, it's great to be anywhere uh, on the on the day app. <laughs> There's got to be a morning after. Um, <laughs> I got. I actually have a story about that about Maria Moldauer. Um, it's a WGN story. Um, and she's saying there's got to no Maureen McGovern. That was it. Right? Maureen McGovern. Yes. Yeah, Maureen McGovern. Maria Moldauer did Midnight at the Oasis. Mar- Maureen McGovern was on Roy Leonard's show. I was engineering. With they, WGN they, Radio in Chicago. Nancy. Right. WGN Radio in Chicago. I did. I engineered a GN for a long time. They yeah. didn't have a cart. They didn't have the music on, on tape, so they had a disc. They had a 45, actually, uh, and they said, well, we've got to play this. You, we want you to play this, so I put the 45 on. I forgot to change the speed from 33 and a third. <laughs> Maureen McGovern is sitting in the studio, and the song begins, There's got to be a morning <laughs> after. Sorry, Roy. Uh, <laughs> Oh, that was you. Yeah, that's, that, when my, that's when my mom turned the dial away. That's right. When people started turning away from WGN radio, it was me. Okay. It was because of me. So that's my Maureen McGovern. That's my brush with fame. Um, yeah. Nancy is with us from the wilds of Maryland. Um, and uh, so you're, uh, you're not getting this crazy rain, are you, over there, I hope? No, it's a beautiful morning. Actually, I went outside this morning because um, it was so nice, and I was trying to calm my nerves for showtime. <laughs> and what did I come across but a second box turtle mama Ooh. laying her eggs. I was checking on nice. whether the cardinal flower was blooming yet, and... I looked down at my feet. There she is. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I better not scare her. And um, <laughs> so I parked my husband out there, and he's taking pictures and watching for me. <laughs> ah. on the show, but... Well, if he's got a good picture and he wants to send it along from this morning. Email I'll... it quickly. Email it quickly. <laughs> I've already dealt with DeMaio's photos, so uh, I might have... <laughs> 
I might have a chance to do that. Uh, and and expl this this is a great introduction to to what you do. Obviously, you've written this wonderful book, uh, which we promoted earlier in the week, The Humane Gardener. <laughs> Um, and it's only in hardcover, folks, just so you know. Okay. Oh, there you go. Hey, I got to have my bookmark sticking out. There we are. Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've got my bookmarks uh, sticking out there, too. Okay, they're all... No, but you, you, you missed my bookmark, Mike. Oh, good, them. good book, bookmark. Yeah, <laughs> I just rip up uh, something, my uh, bank receipts, and put them in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so what... Well, as we start this, I want to start the way you do in your book, which is you were just like the rest of us, like a lot of people when you got into this gardening thing, uh, which is to say y you, you, you wanted some pretty flowers and you were doing what everybody told you to do, the conventional wisdom, um, and then you realized maybe this is not exactly uh, the way this is supposed to work. Yeah, and I think there, uh, there were a couple times where it, that there were probably multiple things that led to that um, sort of revelation. But um, once was when I, I planted butterfly weed because it was pretty. I didn't know. I don't think I knew about the connection with monarchs. I just found a seed pack, and my mm -hmm. favorite color is orange. So, yay! Um, and then in you get a like ding early. For that. <laughs> Early May, which is really unusual, but early May one year, I found a monarch caterpillar already on um, wow. one of the leaves. And then okay. I looked it up. And then another time, I was just, um, it was like, uh, had been a kind of a rough year, and I had kind of let everything go for a while because I was busy at work and everything. And I saw in the fall all these sparrows coming to the switchgrass that I had planted. And everything else in the yard didn't have birds and was kind of barren. And I was just, so I started thinking, well, that's because I don't have any place for them to hide or, or any layers in the landscape. I was planting annuals and vegetables and um, they just all died back in the winter. And, and so I realized I need, I need something that's year round. So I think that's kind of how, how it started. Um, and, and of course, there's nothing wrong with <clears throat> vegetables. We encourage that. Uh, quite a bit uh, on our program, but, oh, yeah. but yeah. in concert, I mean, if you look out in my backyard, my vegetables <laughs> are wherever I have a bare space where there isn't right. a, a perennial uh, of some kind, right. and, and I just slam them in there, and they they coexist pretty well usually. And my yeah, vegetables and are a... full of things flowering, so. Yeah, yeah, and you need the flowers to bring the bees to pollinate the vegetables, so... Uh, it all goes hand in hand. So you, you, you know, you've been, since you've discovered this, that there weren't critters without certain kinds of plants. As you said, it was in the book, it's, you got to figure out what the plants are you need, and then the critters will come. Now, the problem with that, and you're a, a heretic, by the way, uh, you want critters to show up in your yard. A lot of people are trying to keep them out of their yard. So what's the problem with that? Well, um, if you try to be, first of all, the problem is that it's, it, for me, it's really not up to us. We're also in their space. This is their home too. But overall, in the bigger picture, if if you're trying to attract butterflies and bees uh, and birds and the animals that you consider charismatic or pretty or, you know, um, unobtrusive. And then um, you need all this other type of habitat. You need um, dead wood. You need leaves, leaves in the ground layer. You need um, things that are going to also attract snakes, chipmunks, squirrels, um, other animals that people tend to fear uh, because they don't know enough information about them, or they just automatically assume are invading their space. Um, and you can't really have one without the other. Uh, and I, our yard is a testament to that. We have um, threatened bumblebees uh, nesting in our habitat. What, um, what kind of bumblebees are they? American bumblebees. And, okay. Uh, 
they're they used to be really common even 20 years ago and uh they've become more rare um here and in the further south yeah um, in, in, the, they... in, in the midwest uh it's the rusty patched bumblebee which is uh, disappearing yeah. uh, and they used yes. to be everywhere here and now yes. you, you can't find them so the mm -hmm. same thing is happening with a different species yeah, a, a lot. Yeah, a lot of bee species. I mean, and they haven't been studied for that long. The native bees, some of the bumblebees have, but um, you know, we were so focused on honeybees for so long. And so, American bumblebees, for example, what they really need uh, for their nesting habitat, what they really like is is tall grasses that have fallen down. I mean, that's a really mm -hmm. good um, place for them to nest. And as we know, and that's something miles. people would mow or or cut down. So, yeah, you uh, you write um, uh, about this in your book, and and what you say here is uh, by these conventional standards, my property is a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> it's now filled with members of wildlife sustaining species that have been cut down, dug up, sprayed, and otherwise brutalized on this continent for decades, sometimes centuries. It's home to any animal who wants to make a life here and refuge to others just passing through. Only two things are unwelcome, chemicals and invasive vegetation uh, known to supplant wildlife habitat. Everyone else from smart weed to milkweed, from ground beetles to groundhogs has an open invitation. Um, that's that's a pretty remarkable statement. Um, a lot of people would say, "Well, w what about rabbits? What about deer? What about cat?" Or, or rather, Peggy would say, "What about chipmunks?" Um, <laughs> because she has a terrible problem with chipmunks. And you would would you say that it's not a problem, or how would you address that? Well, I would ask first what the problem is um, and what your circumstances are. Peggy, you want to go into that just a, just for a second? Um, well, in the case of the whole, it's it's not just my house; it's the whole area. Um, lots of chipmunks, kind of out of out of balance, as far as how many are there, um, and lots and lots of burrowing under everything, tunnels, and of course, then eating lots of things too, because you know they're going to eat, obviously. So it, it winds up being just lots and lots of burrowing that um, it, running under the patio, running under everything, getting under people's foundations, front porches, you know, not just my house. But there's a, a so, large population of them. Yeah, so is this, so I would wonder if this is long, if, if this has been going on for years and years, if this is recent, because their chipmunks are kind of on a boom and bust cycle. Mm -hmm. And so um, maybe it's not really quantifiable, but maybe every seven years or so, there's a boom for two or three years. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it coordinates with the, the masting uh, years of trees. And um, they can get a lot of the things that they like to eat when there's a lot of nuts around. And so, um, and then in the subsequent years, you'll see more hawks or more foxes um, coming because they have more chipmunks to eat. Mm -hmm. And um, chipmunks are actually solitary. And so they have uh, usually half an acre to maybe two acres is their territory. And so they there's sometimes not, there's, overlap. There there's not gangs of roving chipmunks out there. No, that are... no yeah, but they, and... they are close enough that they chase each other. So there's probably, there's probably a lot of supplemental food sources. There's probably people with bird feeders and things oh, yeah. like that there's... that are attracting them. So there was a study, I think in 2016, um, on, uh, chipmunks activity increasing a lot in the presence of bird feeders and so it doesn't necessarily mean they're all living in that space where you see them they're coming from these different territories around the community yeah. um and and congregating and aggregating yeah. and so uh, there's things that you can do to prevent that you can take down your bird feeders and just have the trees and the other food for them i mean chipmunks also they are omnivores, so they eat snails and other um, 
in other uh, not insects but invertebrates that like to eat eat plants um, so and so they like can help you out too yeah I was just gonna say like a lot of critters mm -hmm. um, there's some good with them uh, yep. folks complain about slugs uh, all the time uh, but slugs are a food source for some animals they also the slime that they produce is important to aggregate soil mm -hmm. Uh, yep. mm -hmm. and, and there are other things that are, are good about pretty much anything that's uh, in your yard. Um, yeah. It's when it gets out of balance that it starts becoming noticeable. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I, I'm really happy <laughs> to see a slug because we had tons of them when we first moved here. There were hostas already here and stuff. And, and um, I don't see them much anymore just because they're hiding in so many places. They're in the leaf mm -hmm. layer. You know, they break, they help with breaking down the leaves and um they um you know they're not that present they're getting eaten <laughs> <laughs> yeah let's um very while we're on the subject of bird feeders um i got an email just yesterday from a listener and viewer uh who who alerted me to uh the state of indiana um that was and, deb uh yeah deb moulton thanks deb uh and the state of indiana is uh, asking people to uh, cut back on the bird feeders because of this mysterious disease that has begun uh, affecting birds. Uh, I found an article in The Guardian yesterday. It says, mystery illness strikes down birds across the U.S. and the Midwest. And, and it's a, um, the, the symptoms are uh, birds suffering from what they call crusty eyes, swollen faces, yeah. and inability to fly. Uh, I yeah. and so uh, a lot of the, some of the scientists anyway are encouraging people to cut back on the bird feeding um, and to, yeah. until, until we can find out what's going on because when birds congregate they spread it uh, amongst each other. Are you yes, familiar with this, it, Nancy? Yeah, I think I mentioned that in my book um, uh, happening out west at the time that I was writing that. Uh, there were big outbreaks, I think, in California. Um, and it it is another reason to uh, not have bird feeders and instead have native plants. I mean, I know bird feeders can be uh, lovely. You can learn to ID birds that way. Um, and you can just learn to enjoy the creatures in your yard, but they cause a lot of conflict with mammals and they can cause a lot of harm to birds and there's several different diseases that birds can get from feeders because there's so many uh, birds congregating there it's yeah. easy transmission i mean it's 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 we've experienced that in the human population you know when you have too many of the same species in one place that's what can happen um and uh, i i saw that a lot this fall, I saw a lot of people posting about pine siskins um, mm -hmm. at, at their bird feeders like 50, 60 at a time because we had an a unusual year with a, a mass migration through here. And I was just wishing that they had more plants for them instead. You know, I'd see these pictures of feeders in mostly lawn yards, uh, and that's the only place they could go to. Whereas here, you know, they were up in the trees, they were climbing along the trees and getting insects, they were on the ground, they were in the pond, you know. So yeah. there are things you can do to enjoy birds that, you know, don't involve artificial feeding. And uh, according to the mm -hmm. U.S. Geological Survey, uh, birds congregating at feeders and baths can transmit disease to one another. They recommend that people cease feeding birds until this mortality event has concluded clean feeders and baths with a 10% bleach solution and avoid handling birds. And if you do, yeah. wear gloves. So this, yeah. is, this is serious stuff. I mean, it's not as if birds aren't mm -hmm. already having problems and we're, and we're witnessing just the disappearance of so many yeah. birds. Uh, so to add this, it, it, it sort of reminds me of what happened to bats a few years ago mysterious disease the white nose mm -hmm. syndrome and yeah. that we still haven't really solved that problem and you know it's all yeah it's all pressure from one species folks 
um, basically that causes yeah. these things. Uh, you can you can almost always trace it back to something we've done, and mostly it's loss of habitat, which is what you're encouraging yeah. with your book. It's like create habitat in your backyard. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Inc including <laughs> the n notorious pokeweed, and I need to get into that. <laughs> Uh, I, I was I, I was out the other day and had the radio on, and Poke Salad Annie came on, and I just I thought, <laughs> all right, I'm talking to Nancy Lawson this Sunday, and and what a great song. Uh, <laughs> Gator got your granny, chump, 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 uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, tell us about uh, I I am one of those people who to this point, and I'm going to change now. As I've, I, there, there was pokeweed in our community garden here on the corner, mm -hmm. smack in the middle of the city of Chicago. How did it get here? Probably a bird pooped it, is what I'm thinking. Um, and I would tell people, oh, you got to dig that up. You got to get that out of here. This is, oh, bad, bad. Ooh, pokeweed. Um, and you're saying <laughs> right. not, not so much. Yeah. I mean, pokeweed is an incredible food source for wildlife. Um, uh, of all kinds. So giant leopard moths lay their eggs on pokeweed leaves and um, surfered flies go to the flowers. I haven't seen it, but I've read that hummingbirds go to the flowers. Foxes, um, opossums eat the berries and migrating birds. So I have a really funny story from, um, not really funny, but interesting story from this past um, winter when we had painted buntings coming uh, to oh. a park in Maryland and this is really unusual for them to come this far north and people were posting pictures it's a very wooded uh, park and they were posting pictures they took from afar so as not to disturb this little guy it was kind of like across a river and i started looking at the pictures and almost every time this painted bunting was in the pokeweed it was either perching in it or eating the eating the berries which were kind of desiccated but i guess they were like pokeweed raisins to him and so <laughs> it's one of the most important food sources um for migratory birds there's there were like 15 identified uh um by researchers at university of rhode island uh along the eastern flyway and um, pokeweed was on the list as a good berry source mm. and um and I have to tell you too, my husband was in Germany at a conference a couple of years ago and he went to the Botanic Garden and the first thing he saw was this proudly displayed American pokeweed <laughs> with a label and everything at the entrance. Unbelievable. So, um, we, well, we're ripping it out here and in Europe they're displaying it well, prou proudly. <laughs> right there you've got part of the problem though, the, it's got weed in the name. Yes, we should call it pokeberry, which some people do. Right and yeah. and uh, butterfly flower instead of butterfly yeah. weed or, or or milk weed or milk flower or whatever yeah. we just attach the word weed because that's what a lot of folks did early you know centuries ago sometimes yeah. uh, and we're stuck with it and then people say yeah. well that's a weed uh, and we need yeah. to get rid of it um, and 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 the argument they make about pokeweed is well the berries are poisonous. Well, folks, all right, if you knew how many plants out there are poisonous, you, exactly. wouldn't, even, you wouldn't walk outside. You just, you know, and, and, and even indoors. You know how many <laughs> tropical, right. tropicals you have in your, in your house? If you put those in your salad, you're going to keel over, okay? So yeah. uh, th that's, that's life. That's nature. So yes. we ne need to have a little respect, more respect, because nature ha does have a purpose, and it's not just to kill human beings. Um, <laughs> right. in, in fact, uh, uh, often nature is not very good at doing that, So, uh, but we're, we're good at flipping it around. Um, all right, well, we need to take a break. I'm going <laughs> to uh, tell people, when we come back, I'm going to show some quick photos from your yard and talk about some of the plants mm -hmm. and animals that you have there. And then we're going to bring in a special guest. Well, if people read the reports I put out on social media, they, they know who the special guest is already. But it's a great story um, about an HOA, which is a homeowners association. And if any of you have ever been, uh, you know, brutalized by an HOA, you're going to appreciate this story. It's a woman who happens to be your sister, <laughs> uh, and uh, 
<laughs> who uh, tried to plant a native garden, and, and the HOA said, no, we need lawn. Uh, and the story, we need chemicals. We need chemicals. Yes, we need death and destruction. Um, and what happened as a result? So stick around for that as well. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We're talking critters in your yard, and we'll be right back. You can help slow climate change in 2021 by composting. And you don't even need a backyard. By composting communally in multi-unit buildings across Chicagoland, Collective Resource Compost has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. CRC brings you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter, they swap it out, and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. Whether you're a farmer or a backyard gardener, assist your soil in providing key nutrients to your plants with Spectrum Soil Inoculum from Tinyo Biologicals. The beneficial microorganisms in Spectrum break down and release vital nutrients and make them more accessible to your plants. Spectrum works with nature to decompose organic matter into humus, building richer, healthier soil. Spectrum is approved for use on certified organic crops and is OMRI listed. Get Spectrum at blazing-star.com. New water bottle. Yeah, those paper cups can really add up. This is a simple way to help reduce trash and waste, and with Waste Reduction Week coming up... Speaking of which, how do we tell Oscar there'll be less trash? Did someone say there'll be less trash? Yeah, we'll still give our trash to you. There'll just be less. Is that trash there for me? Oh, no, this is my reusable water bottle. I can use it again and again. Oh, Sorry. well, if it's not trash, then scrap! Waste Reduction Week. Take action at WRWCanada.com. See, whoa, why did that do that? Okay, let's put those back here. <laughs> um, um, you see, I'm doing public service announcements for Canada now. This is, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's... This is but it, as, as long as they have Muppets in them, see, whenever there's, <laughs> whenever there's a Muppet in something, um, I'm happy to do the, uh, the public service announcement. I've been, I've been tracking down, um, some old. Folks who watch the show know this. I've been tracking down classic, I guess you would call them, public service announcements for the environment. And a lot of them just happen to be featuring the Muppets. So that's <laughs> why we, I pop those in. Hey, uh, welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. That's Nancy Lawson. Let's hold up the book again. Uh, so folks, uh, get a copy of this. You should. This is an excellent, excellent book. And it, it's one of those books that will change the way you think about gardening. There's a handful that I've read uh, in my lifetime that have really mm -hmm. affected me. This is one of them. Um, and uh, it's really easy to read. Um, uh, Nancy's not a scientist, but she is a journalist. And you write like a journalist, and uh, we appreciate mm -hmm. that. So, um, and it's, it's got a local connection in the book, too. Right, Charlotte Edelman. Thank you so yeah. much. Charlotte Edelman is in, who's been on our show a number of times. I've been working oh, with. Nice. Oh yeah, I've been working with her yeah. um, mm -hmm. in Chicago on our stupid weed law, which uh, fines people for growing native plants and praises them for putting poisons in grass seed down uh, on their uh, property. So um, you still have that law? Oh my gosh, yes. Oh lordy, it was looked like it was. They were going to do a. Uh, and for folks who are not aware of this, there, uh, Alderman Hopkins uh, had uh, a, uh, a native plant registry that he was trying to get through city council. Well, apparently the mayor in her infinite wisdom doesn't like that idea, and so that has been scrapped. Um, and I don't know what our mayor thinks in terms of the environment, uh, pretty much nothing. As far as I can tell, we talked about this a few weeks ago when we had a couple of the former heads of the environment of the city of Chicago on this very program. Um, I don't know what the heck she's doing, but um, so that has been scrapped. And so we're still stuck with, you know, uh, I, if there are any folks out there uh, from the city watching, they could come and probably find me right now uh, for the plants I have in my front yard. Good luck. Go for it. Um, of course, I shouldn't poke the bear, should I? Uh, <laughs> at, at, at any rate, let's let's take a look at, at your yard. Nancy, uh, by the way, as we mentioned, she wrote that book. You should get a copy of it. You can go to her website, which is uh, 
is it thehumanegardener.com or just humanegardener.com? Just Humane Gardener. Humane yeah. Gardener. And she yeah. also, um, um, Donna uh, said, Nancy also has a terrific Facebook page by the same name. Uh, Donna's writing in. Yeah. Um, and uh, so uh, I, I would advise you guys to, uh, to take a look at it. So let's, let's look at, at what your situation is. This is, as you say, no lawn. Look, Ma, no lawn. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, this is, um, it was a new path that we made last year um, to a new stoop. <laughs> and we put those branches down in a lot of places to line the path. So I consider that kind of stuff just as important as the actual plants themselves. Sure. Um, because uh, no sooner did we do that than they started breaking down and then the downy woodpeckers would come every morning and um, peck along the branches and get their breakfast. And, um, and so we leave all the leaves um, wherever mm -hmm. they fall because we don't have to worry about lawns since we don't have any. We have a little patch of, you know, sort of old uh, grass that I keep... Um, encroaching upon with native plants of course of course <laughs> the little token and, grass patch just for yeah. vintage, vintage sake yeah, yeah yeah and and more as you can see go, there's it, it's an easy way to take care of your lawn if you don't have oh, one yeah. you know yeah 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 and um and so here i have a lot of um uh, plants that I had just planted actually the year before and that's how much it filled in and what I do is kind of just take over the um, space of old stilt grass and things mm -hmm. like that um, a little at a time uh, and and then I let it all reseed um, and then things like American burnweed come up along the edges that's something people would usually pull but here, what happens is the deer come by and they love American burnweed and they love these little things that I let seed along the edge like common evening primrose. And that gives them something to eat as they walk along. Um, and that's how an the animals tend to use these paths really a lot. The turtles, the deer, the rabbits. <laughs> yeah, as you, as you, go ahead, Peggy. Oh, I was going to say, as you were converting the lawn, what were you putting in first? What were... What were oh, like so the first I, plantings? Yeah, so first I was putting in um, uh, actually seedlings that had seeded into the front pathways, <laughs> huh. and I needed um, I needed more space to put them. So it was things like uh, blue mist flower and um, sea oats and. Uh, cardinal flower and rudbeckia. See, I wish I could grow cardinal flower. I, I I don't have enough sun, for one yeah. thing. Yeah, oh, and, and mine the, never come back. And, Same thing, not enough sun. Yeah, uh, but I have a uh, uh, great blue lobelia. Lo oh, that does recede really well, right? Oh my goodness, yeah. it 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 just uh, I've got huge patches of it in my backyard, and I love it. I think it's great. Well, what trees yeah. kind of trees are we looking at here? So the the tall um, whitish barked ones are tulip poplars, and this is at this this is mm -hmm. the site of my old vegetable garden, and um, the I kept on trying to pull the saplings out when I was growing vegetables there, and realized the sassafras loved it, the tulip poplars loved loved mm -hmm. it, so I decided just to let it um, let it all turn into woodland. And Why not? Then behind it. Yeah, behind it is an American smoke tree, the orange one, which is hmm. just spectacular in the fall. Yeah. Uh, that I planted. Um, yeah. And you didn't plant these guys. Um, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and this I love so much because so this was the pond we made just last year. And... Um, and this is a green frog and a bullfrog. And, and when you look at it, at first you think, oh, look at those little friends. Well, um, I, I, was, I thought it was probably a bullfrog um, um, based on, you know, IDing it and on top. And I sent it to a, a herpetologist who confirmed and said, well, that bullfrog probably wants to eat that green frog. But <laughs> oh, the bullfrog no probably isn't big enough yet yeah oh dear 
Yeah, oh um, dear. Well, well. Speaking so, of uh, uh, of that, and I don't. I, I'm gonna uh, apologize for some reason. These photos are slightly out of focus, and I do not understand why. Because I just lifted them from your the file. Yeah. It's uh, like they resized themselves or something. I think they did. Something odd okay. happened. So my apologies for that. But uh, are we going to be R-rated because of this uh, photo? <laughs> Um, I don't know, but um, this is the kind of thing you get to see when you have habitat. <laughs> That's true, and 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 you know you have to say nobody hates frogs, and to well maybe some people hate uh, toads because I guess uh, in certain parts of the country they can be thugs uh, in the garden. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, amphibians in general are always welcome. It's it's other critters that we have issues with, which are generally snakes and chipmunks and deer and rabbits as i mentioned before but you look at frogs and toads everybody goes yeah we want frogs and toads in our <laughs> uh, yeah and another these are wood frogs oh are they okay and and they are in the act right oh yeah yeah and, um, <laughs> there would there i have these videos of them a whole melee of them in yeah the pond. yeah uh, and of course, uh, something I'm always taking photos of in my yard, although I have had very little success in finding eggs and never caterpillars. Uh, my, yeah. I don't do not. And I got a lot of milkweed in my yard now over the years. It has sprung up. In fact, if I ever sell this house, I'm going to have to issue a warning to uh, mm -hmm. whoever buys it and say, hey, you're going to see milkweed pop up all over the place. Just if you don't, <laughs> don't tell them about the cup plants, that's all. Right. Well, you're going to yeah. see cup, cup plants come back too. If you don't like it, just in milkweed, eh, I just cut it down wherever it doesn't, <laughs> it, it shouldn't be. But yeah. uh, obviously you have uh, a few monarchs uh, around. Yeah. Uh, this one is hard and like because of the, uh, again, because of uh, the focus, but that's a beautiful hummingbird moth. Um, I, I, I get yeah. those occasionally in my yard too. They're very cool. Yeah. Yeah, they're very cool. And um and they they people don't realize what they are oftentimes. Because <laughs> well, they're day flying moths too. Yeah. Uh and this, they're big. Yeah. And this one uh is maybe the coolest fly ever. It uh <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love it. It's it's like it just woke up and it hasn't combed its hair yet. This is crazy. I love it too. I know. I love it's so cute. Um uh, a tachinid tachinid fly. Yeah. Right, tachinid fly. Tachinid um fly, yeah. and this is not from your husband, but this is uh a turtle. Um This is a turtle, yeah, one with that we watched uh just two or three weeks ago, yeah. Yeah, laying and, her eggs. Oh, really? Oh my goodness! So, well, this see, you get to this see... picture. She's. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Uh, oh, she's on her way down the path, um, and she explored multiple nesting sites till uh -huh. she found one in the wood chips. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Nancy, as you converted your yard into a habitat, um, how long did it take? for a lot of these critters to start appearing i mean were they there were they there right away was it the next year what were you noticing um i think they were there right away for sure like that early monarch caterpillar and the sparrows and the switch but the, yeah, the turtles the but, amphibians yeah well the tur so turtles typically have the same home range um mm -hmm. their whole life so we we had turtles and um they they just didn't have any habitat and um they didn't have any place to hide and as i think i mentioned in my book um actually one got mowed and mm. that's a horrible yeah yeah ho horrible situation because you can't afford to lose any turtles you know they're mm -hmm. so no population is so fragile and it happens all the time and people hit them on our road with cars. So um, I'm really trying to raise awareness about that. I mean, they've managed to make it for so many millennia because of their protective shells, but we have this equipment now that, you know, hurts them. So, so we had the, we had animals here. They just didn't, they were just in peril, you know, um, uh, as far as insects, I guess it only took, you know, the first couple, first patch of native plants. <laughs> that helps. Um, what, what's Plant this, it, they will come. What is the bird yeah. we're looking at? 
this is a northern flicker and um, mm -hmm. we have these really cool videos of the flickers uh in under the maple tree here um uh in the leaves just just drilling away for the ants and the beetles and um so that's a big reason to leave the leaves too it's amazing to see the birds uh, foraging in there there's lots of caterpillars and pea right. pie in there so and uh uh, uh everybody's <laughs> arch arch enemy uh the uh, chipmunk oh no he's my best friend so this is mr chippy he was my he was uh always here um during covid you know i would go out on the patio um and he just started he would sort of appear from behind the retaining wall <laughs> and um he would do things like nibble a snail and leave me the shell like he was at a crab feast you know um yeah. <laughs> leaving all his stuff around and um you know they 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 don't we just are delighted by them i don't they have a little burrow in the patio garden um but i don't i i I don't notice any problems with it at all. In fact, it creates more habitat. Um, Cicada wasp killer made her nest on on top of the chippy burrow last year. <laughs> the chippy burrow, Mr. Chippy. All right, and now here's a photograph which brings us to our next guest. This is a yard that is, um, well, if 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 you ask me, it's a, a disgrace. It's uh, uh, just, <laughs> look at all those flowers. They're too tall. I, no, really. I mean, what does this person think <laughs> she's doing? And we should probably bring that person in here now. So uh, there she is in the lower right-hand part of your screen. That's Janet Crouch, and you guys are sisters, huh? So you're both troublemakers, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> Yep. <laughs> uh, w welcome, Janet, uh, to uh, to the to the show, and to we're so excited to to hear about your story. Um, I'm going to introduce the story by way of the video that uh, you put together, which is uh, uh, there's um, no uh, soundtrack to it. You can read it as it's uh, going by. There's there's uh, titles there, so I'm going to leave our mics open so that we can comment on it as, as it goes by. Is that, is that okay with you? That sounds great, but I would like to say that Mike Pugh, um, who lives in Virginia and also battled his HOA, put it together. I ah. met Mike on social media and he is just fabulous. So shout out to Mike Pugh who made the video. <laughs> Fantastic, all right, I'm gonna find the uh, audio here there it is and uh we can we can start this and uh folks i think will find this entertaining And there they are. There's the lovely couple there in their own garden. Uh, and that's a photo you saw a second ago. A little bit of area. It's a lovely garden, I, I have to admit. Thank you. Yeah, it's not all native. There are uh, annuals. Uh-huh. And then you got this. Oh, my God intimidating and surprisingly vicious emails what shocking emails yeah really i mean yes. that, that doesn't sound very professional to me uh it was <laughs> extremely unprofessional <laughs> yeah oh my god pesticide free plants ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh what's next nature that's crazy um yeah so and and did they even know? Know what? Oh, the the um, the other board members. Did they even know that this law firm was doing it? You know, that's a really good question. Um, I think they knew generally, but I've gotten the sense that they did not read the communications that came to us. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know for certain, but. It seemed to sort of happen in a vacuum with just a few people. 
if you are yeah. part of that HOA board. And and they they spent a hundred thousand wow. dollars in fighting Ooh, your that. fighting your garden, which is nuts, which is <laughs> just which it is, and uh, and fighting this the these photo photographs and videos of butterflies and bees and beautiful plants, some of them as you say native and others native, and the idea was that and and, and I have it written in my my blog post they wanted a lawn they they came out and and pretty much said it um yes yes they directed us to replace our entire garden with turf grass and we had our garden for about 15 years before we got the first threatening letter from the hoa Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't a new garden, it's in our front yard, they were aware of it, but one neighbor, we came to find out later, had uh, complained. And he complained anonymously for a number of years and they apparently ignored his complaints. And then he started using his uh, assistant inspector general for in investigations of the Legal Services Corporation, which is a congressionally funded government quasi-governmental agency email address to send uh, complaints about us and our property to the board. And he made a uh, some sort of alliance with the HOA attorney. He was communicating with him directly um, and it all spiraled from there. Hmm. And I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by how nasty they were about this. It, it, um, that's the part that stuns me, that um, here you have this garden, and they didn't just say, look, it's really it's violating the HOA guidelines. What if they had been nice about it? Would you still have fought them this hard? We certainly probably would have been able to come to some sort of agreement uh, much earlier on. Um, Nancy and I and my husband participated in a so-called hearing before the HOA board in September of 2018. And we talked to, we tried to talk to them sort of offline, which our attorney recommended that we do around, you know, around the table in the meeting room. But Sean Suhar, the HOA attorney, um, told me to shut up, told, yelled at Nancy to be quiet. I mean, um, he said it in so many words. He said, shut up. Oh, he said it directly. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. No, he yelled it at me to shut up when oh, I was trying goodness. to talk to a board member. Yeah. And, and. So. Uh, it became uh, clear then, Mike, that they were not interested in, in he wasn't at least, settling. I, and uh, this is my favorite part, I think. Um, the attorney used quotes around words and concepts he apparently viewed as suspicious, such as, quote, garden, <laughs> and, <laughs> and wrote disparagingly of the Crouch's, quote, environmentally sensitive agenda. Ooh, mm -hmm. that's <laughs> right. scary. Oh, my right. goodness. Pesticide free through the plants. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. no. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah we you, were the bad guys. You crazy lefty pinko commie. Oh, <laughs> nature yeah. friendly. Uh, that's I don't right. Even, don't even know what to say. How so, dare you? Yeah, exactly. So they're nasty. They're mean. And you say, okay, we're going to take them on. And um, how long did that court battle last? Uh, we didn't file in court uh, until a couple, almost two years after they started coming after us. Um, we hired an attorney immediately, um, and we found that that's difficult to do because there are very few attorneys who represent homeowners um, in these battles against HOAs. HOAs have so much power. Yeah. Um, so we thankfully found a great law firm, Skipper Law in Crofton, Maryland, who helped us out. Um, but we would go months and months in between uh, getting communications from them. In the meantime, people going by our house all the time, taking pictures. It was extremely traumatic. Um, the when whole you say experience. taking pictures uh, to prove something, uh, to, to catch prove you. something, right. What? Who knows? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, and, and there was, because um, Nancy, you wrote this up on your blog, which I just posted the link. They were saying things like six foot butterfly statues and all sorts of weird things. Yeah, I mean, I was at that hearing and 
they just let the neighbor come in and go through this outrageous, fantastical list. And the lawyer also, when we would challenge um, certain phrasings in the letter, the letter, obviously, the initial letters um, to, to Janet and Jeff were just, just pulled excerpts from other threatening letters they had used. They weren't customized at all. And oh my so gosh. it said things like, your garden is attracting mosquitoes and stuff. And so we brought this up and we brought up like why a native plant garden helps with that actually. And um, he and the lawyer, Sean Suhar said, I said mosquitoes. I never said I never said that. And we're like, here's the letter right here, right here. with your name on it. Yeah. And so it, it was that kind of farcical situation that at first made us think, we'll be able to fight this. And and then the the community, just the board members just didn't, like you said, Piggy didn't know what was going on and didn't care. Um, and yeah, so that, that's it, the bad part. I mean, not knowing that's that's your first crime, because as a board member, anybody who's ever been on a board knows that you, there's a responsibility that you have to be aware of what's happening. And you can be held liable for that and accountable. Um, and so then you th you find out later that they didn't really even know how much money was being spent on this. Is that right, Janet? It doesn't appear that they did. The numbers in the portal that board members have access to were very confusing. Um, they didn't like to talk about it. They like to talk about parking and trash cans and the board meetings and Whenever I would bring this up, sort of the meeting would end, and and that would be the end of it. So yikes! Yeah. All right, yeah. so flash forward. Yeah, you uh, you take it to so court. Flash forward. Yes, we take it to court. Well, so we never actually we had a pretrial hearing which showed us that um, it's a crapshoot in court. So we okay. ended up settling our case and retaining most of our garden. Um, so. But the, the, the best thing that came out of it is that we got a state law um, passed. And well, so we wait, wait, wait. You're, now you're skipping steps. I mean, you know, <laughs> what? A, a state. I know, 11, Mike. I, <laughs> I know, but a, a state. I, well, you're not going to get to tell the whole story, but the state law didn't appear out of nowhere. Obviously, while you were working on this court case, you were talking to legislators as well, right? Yes. Um, so through, through connections that I made on Facebook, I talked to a lot of different people who'd gone through similar situations, difficult situations with their HOAs or community associations. And um, someone suggested that I contact our state legislators, which I did. And then my husband and I started um, attending local environmental events to try to, to meet them. And we did at one event, a Bee City event in September, and then in October, uh, somebody from a legislative aide from our local delegate's office, Terry Hill, um, reached out and said that they were interested in introducing legislation. So Nancy and I worked with Mary Catherine Cochran, who worked for Terry at the time. Um, and it was introduced in 2019 to 2020 session. Um, and it was doing really well going through the legislature, but then COVID hit. So it was introduced again this year and um, passed almost unanimously. Um, it will be going into effect October 1st. Um, the governor didn't sign it, but he didn't veto it. So it will go into law effective October 1. So that was our main goal with that, was to ensure that no other families have to go through what our family had to endure at the hands of an HOA just for trying to responsibly garden and help the planet. And don't worry, um, I'm in control of the time here. So if, <laughs> if, 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 if we slop over the top of the hour, it's not a big deal. But so what, <laughs> So before we go, what does the law state? What, what, what is now the law of the land in Maryland? That uh, low impact HOA boards um, cannot uh, restrict homeowners from planting low in impact landscaping. Um, which includes pollinator gardens. Um, Nancy, what are some of the other? Um, Green gardens. Um, they called it biohabitats. Um, and it, they can't, it says in the law too that they can't require turf grass. Um, and. Ah, I like so, that. Give that a ding. That was the, yes, that yes. was the main thing. Yeah. That would have saved us. 
three years ago when all of this started. Oh my they goodness. wouldn't have been able to demand that. So this is what I love about this story is that you get one cranky guy, and that's the way these, these things often work. One dumb, cranky jerk gets a bee in his bonnet, no, no pun intended, and uh, we wish we wish that would happen actually one grouch <laughs> right and and as i wrote on my my uh, my blog it was crouch versus grouch all right is 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 what we had here and so the it backfires it blows up in his face and now the entire state gets to benefit from um his uh, intransigence it's just a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> story, Janet. It really, really, and it couldn't have happened though unless you guys fought, and that's the important thing. You didn't mm -hmm. take it lying down. You you didn't say, "All right, we'll just put in the lawn." Thank you for standing up for plants, for animals, for habitat. Um, uh, this is, and I hope it becomes a uh, a model law across the country. Wouldn't that be cool? It most certainly yeah. would. And thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, so, no, I didn't. I didn't get to be fifty-four years old to to lay down and have you know have an <laughs> HOA take control of my life. Oh so. my, my goodness, I absolutely get that. And so, it, it, people who are in HOAs all over the globe, <laughs> rise up, folks, rise up. Um, absolutely. And, yeah, because I know some HOAs that are are pretty uh, tyrannical. Um, well, uh, listen, thank you both uh, for being on the show today. Nancy, the, the Humane Gardener, go to humanegardener.com. You can go to her Facebook page. Um, you can pick up her book one more time. Let's uh, get the cover out there, The Humane Gardener. Uh, it was written six years ago, but it's, uh, it's a terrific book, and I'm sure there's plenty of copies still available. Uh, and Janet Crouch, congratulations on your, your victory in court and in the uh, Maryland General Assembly. Uh, what a great thing. What a great story. You know, we don't get a lot of positive environmental stories in the world. So it's a, it reminds me of the one we just had in Illinois, uh, the right to garden uh, bill that got passed in the Illinois General Assembly because a woman was being prohibited from growing vegetables under a hoop house in her backyard. She took it to the General Assembly. They said, well, that's crazy. And they, they passed the law. Um, mm. I, I love the way that when it works that way. So, uh, yeah. um, so thank you both. You guys have a wonderful Sunday and I hope we talk again very, very soon. Thank you Thanks so much. And Peggy. Thank you. All right, it's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. As we mentioned before, it's bonus to Mayo Day because of all the crazy weather. So stick around. We'll be right back. When I'm with an older tree, you know, and there's just something about it that draws you to it, as similar to the ocean, draws you to it. And when I see a big tree and I'm going to climb it, I enjoy that moment, and I'll give the tree a big old hug. My name's Chase Ferris. I work out of the Clackamas office just outside Portland, Oregon. I've been with Bartlett Tree Experts since October of 2016, and I'm a climber. I was kind of surprised and taken back by the, the quality of equipment and the amount of effort that goes into keeping everyone safe and keeping the jobs productive and making sure that you are progressing every day. And I enjoy that because I like to learn. I like the raptor and we, we use it quite a bit out on the west coast. Our trees are pretty tall and the, the raptor is great for saving energy, allowing you to get into the canopy with minimal physical exertion so that you're fresh and ready to climb and do what you need to do, you know, when you're 65, 70 feet up or higher. So at my office I feel like you could take just about anyone, put a crew together and send them out to a job and have it be successful and that has to do with trusting the people you work with, feeling safe around them, and knowing their strengths and weaknesses. Every tree needs a champion. Welcome to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio with just a sip on of humor. Or is that a dash? Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Here they are again, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. All I need is good food to eat and make me healthy, wealthy, wide awake. Lettuce, tomatoes, root of bacon. What about those sweet potatoes? All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good tools to make me music.
music porches, long serene. And welcome back. Oh, so he's, uh, he's uh, whoop, popping on the screen. I can hear his mic uh, over there. Let's uh, fade in Rick DeMaio. Hey, Mr. Rick. And as, as Amos posted, yay, bonus Dr. Rick. Uh, uh, your fans are out there, Rick. You me as well? What's that? Yeah, there you go. Does he join me as well? No, 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 no. Back to Just Rick. Me. Yeah. Oh, you, there we go. Um, wow. Talk about crazy days. Um, yeah, it's fun to be a meteorologist, isn't it? Uh, yeah, at certain uh, uh, <laughs> times of the uh, year um, and at certain uh, times of uh, our existence. Uh, these are uh, the first thing that comes to mind. I, I, I look at we're going to talk about heat in the West and the rains in the, the center of the country. Um, buildings collapsing in Miami. Yeah. And um, there are a lot of people who say they're all connected. Um, would you agree with that? Um, well, I'm not a structural engineer. Yeah. And I can't comment on whether or not there's been any sort of decay of the limestone bedding underneath the building or whether or not there has been you know, any sort of degradation to the outside of the building due to, you know, salt water intrusion and things like that. But I mean, it, those kind of things, when you only have one building come down of many, it's always a combination of a lot of things. Yeah. So, I mean, if that was the case, you would have buildings coming down all the time. So that's why I'm, I'm not going to even go down that path of saying it has anything to do with climate change. Uh, but I mean, a barrier island in itself is a big sandbar. And when you have limestone bedding underneath it, obviously they've done a pretty good job over the last, what, 70 years constructing 30 story buildings on that barrier island up and down the Florida coast and everywhere else. Um, so this is clearly something that's probably more structurally engineering uh, mm -hmm. related. I wouldn't even attempt to relate it to climate change, but does weather have any sort of impact on something becoming less strong over a period of time? Of course, but that's why you have humans and technology to um, mitigate and adapt to those things to decreases your vulnerability. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, that is probably the least connected to what we're, yeah. we're talking about. Yeah, but, it's just that kind of ran through the thread of some of the reports on that collapse. Yeah, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even try to thread it with with climate. Mm -hmm. Well, then let's let's start with uh, what happened here in Chicago in the in the Midwest uh, yesterday, which was uh, pretty nutty um, because uh, I think I was in the swath of rain that was yeah. uh, the four inch because uh, it uh, my basement flooded so fast um, and I had just had it rotted on Tuesday um, and it flooded. Oh. Yeah. And uh, which means that it wasn't, I'm sorry to hear that. yeah, it wasn't blocked. It, um, no, it, wasn't, it, it was your it, street. The system, street main. The system was just overwhelmed. And as a matter of fact, here's uh, some of that radar from uh, that you sent, which is just, yeah. uh, you can see that training that, and as I was watching it on, TV just thinking, uh, I please, I want this to stop right now because uh, wow. it's, it, and, and, uh, yeah, there and up lot north it was just this constant clouds to the south, these huge dark clouds. Right. You yes. know what, Mike and Peg, I, I emailed Deborah Shore my reports, um, mm -hmm. and I think you should send her an email and tell her what happened because I think she'd be um, interested to find out that your street flooded when it probably really shouldn't have with that much rain, even though we had rain the day before, the system is designed to take on a lot of water in a short amount of time. Um, this yeah, is that's Deborah Shore with MWRD. Right. Right. You know, Deborah Shore with the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. And um, uh, she gets my reports, and I think she'd be interested to know that your basement flooded. Was it, you know, was it more localized? Because clearly this is something that she needs to know about, but the bottom line was um, in Mike's area and up in Peg's area, over the course of the last five or six days, we've gotten nearly a half a foot of rain. Um, mm -hmm. So we've gone from we've gone from the public lawns going from Triscuits to tropical <laughs> rainforest like that. 
which is not the way that's supposed to work. I mean, I even heard the the guy on uh, on on CBS yesterday saying, "Yeah, we wanted rain, but we didn't want it like this. Uh, it would have been." Uh, better, but it didn't ask us. The right, no, it, we, we didn't have a say in the matter. Um, but yeah, my rain gauge uh, as of yesterday afternoon, I didn't even look at it this morning. I don't think we got much last night, if anything. Um, mm-hmm. But I was at four and a half inches, and that was after yeah. two two inches uh, last Sunday. So that's six and a half inches in my backyard in the last five days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and and if you notice uh, now, there's mushrooms growing everywhere out of the. <laughs> Out of the ones, have you noticed that? Uh, I did not see. No, I haven't seen that. But uh, yeah. uh, that's probably happening. So, and also, an, another thing is mosquitoes. We're going to start to see mosquitoes now because there's going to be standing yeah, water you know, everywhere. That that's been really interesting because I mean the black flies are always the problem this time of the year, especially along the lakefront. Um, but I was amazed at being up in Wisconsin. I go up there every Sunday, and no mosquitoes. Um, mm-hmm. I played golf last. Twice in the last week, um, Mike. Don't take offense to this. I just ah, like to get okay. out on my own. That's no, no, fine. I just like to get out on my own and play. And I hate it when I'm out there trying to work on my game, and someone says, "Hey, do you mind if I tag along?" <laughs> and I go, "Yeah, I, I kind of do." <laughs> I just, I don't want to, I don't want to like know where you're from, know what you've done in the past. I don't, I don't care about anything because I'm never going to see you again. I just want to play golf. Um, but the bottom line was there were no mosquitoes. And is that mm. something that's going to probably happen? Um, probably I would say so, yes. I think you make a good point there. What's also interesting, you know, last week, or I think it may have been last week or two weeks ago, we were talking about uh, there was a report on Channel 11, the WTTW, about the drought. And they had a woman from the Morton Arboretum. I forget her name. If I if I if I recall it, Mike, you would probably go, I know her. And they also had someone from Argonne National Lab. Uh-huh. Um, they had actually called me up early in the day, uh, emailed me and said, would you like to be on our panel? But I didn't get back to them in time, so they had to go to somebody else, which I totally get. And Brandis asked this climate scientist um, from Argonne, is this drought related to climate change? And he started to go down this path going, yeah, I think it is. And I was like, stop the presses. First off, this is a small term drought in a small region. And when you compare it to the rest of the Midwest, there's no drought. So what he should have done was he should have said, this is not due to climate change directly. It's due to climate change indirectly. And then the indirect consequences of a changing climate is an increase in variability. Now, I sent him an email explaining all that. And he went, wow, I never thought about it that way. I'd like to sit down with you one day and pick your brain. Because I think I saw him struggling with how to Mm -hmm. answer a question that was related to a more regional view of what's going on in the Midwest. So when you get to the point of trying to describe what has happened in the last two weeks, where we've gone from severe drought Mm -hmm. to basically six inches of rain, it's due to this highly variable pattern that's totally related to what's going on in the Pacific Northwest and totally related to what's going on in the Gulf of Mexico. Very warm, very wet, and we got kind of caught in the middle. And that middle, because now we're heading into the warmer part of summer, has now pushed northward. So the same wet pattern that was from Texas and Kansas and Missouri and Southern Illinois has now kind of inched northward a little bit, but the overall pattern has not changed. It's just kind of move northward a little bit, which is good news. But if you go, Rick, or you ask me, Rick, is the heat out west in the Pacific Northwest, more specifically, a climate-related event? Without a doubt that is, because we're seeing numbers off the charts. And the fact that that huge dome of warm air is actually dipping the jet stream right down over us, you don't see that too often. So the bottom line, high degree of variability, if you're on the tail end of spring, you're going to get either really wet or if you're going into the beginning part of summer, as we saw with nine days of 90 degrees, you're going to get really dry in a short amount of time. And that's climate variability. And that's related to a changing overall atmospheric climate that says if it happens at a certain time of the year and you catch that wave at the end of spring 
or the beginning of summer, the consequences are going to be really extreme, if that uh, makes sense. Yeah, and speaking of extreme, you sent these, the new temperature record set for June 26 uh, on the West Coast. Uh, this is just stunning. And, 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 and I speak as a guy who had a home out there for 17 years. Yeah. So, so, and what and we we've, to, we've got a viewer in Portland too. Who's right. Who's watching us right now. Correct. Ernest, Ernest Renard is, is watching. Um, and, um, and by the way, well, he, um, and, uh, so maybe, uh, you can help Ernest out, but, uh, look at these temperatures and Vancouver, Washington, which is just, uh, ab above the, uh, Columbia river, uh, the state right, line right, right. in w just north of Portland, Oregon. Yeah, it's not Vancouver, British Columbia. Yeah. Right. It's Vancouver, yeah. Washington, which Washington. is a different Vancouver. And we got a howdy from uh, Ernest. Back to you, Rick. Um, and the Portland Airport, 108. Look at that. And he was, wasn't was uh, Ernest mentioning even a higher temperature than yeah, that? Yeah, he said 115 today, but yesterday it was either 106 or 109, he mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and two things two things to really take away from this, Mike and Peg, and to your uh, listeners and, and viewers right now. Notice when these records were set, the time of the year. But look at the dates up on the top. Okay. August 8th, August 10th, July 30th. That's the heart yeah. of the summer. These, these oh, were right. broken literally five weeks ahead of schedule. Five yeah, weeks wow. ahead of schedule and broken by, by four degrees. In addition to that, overnight lows in Seattle the last two nights didn't break 70. That's an overnight low. That's an all-time record low minimum, 70 degrees. So I always say you could always kind of make a case for a changing climate during the summertime because it's the summertime is when the warm temperatures really make a difference to people's mm -hmm. psyche. Warm temperatures in the middle of January – I love it. Why are you guys getting so pissed off on the fact that it's 55 degrees in January? Don't you like not shoveling snow? Don't you like not freezing? Yeah. So the bottom line is you can never really truly make a case for people to get it when it's cold out. You can make a case for it when there's hurricanes. You can make a case for it when it's hot. Uh, you can't make a case for it when there's tornadoes. Tornadoes are still not in that kind of vernacular of climate change. But flooding rains, drought, heat waves, um, and record high uh, water content in the atmosphere is mm -hmm. definitely all related. And uh, we've got yeah. Mary Kate Mackey, who's been on our program. She's a garden communicator. She's living in uh, Eugene, Oregon, and she says record breaking oh here as well. So, and that's you know a little farther south. Uh, and I'm looking at these numbers. What I was struck by, and tell me whether this means anything at all, Rick is uh, the old record for the daily maximum. There was no old record on there before 2006. They're all in the last 15 years, okay? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, the same, that... same thing for the daily warmest minimum, they're all within the last 15 years. Yeah, I mean, yeah the monthly look... maximums go back a bit, but... Right. If you, if you go back to really the last 15 years... 12 of the last 15 years are the 12th warmest ever since 1880, which is really remarkable. And, and what that shows you is that heat begets heat. So when you get warm, it's really tough to get cool if your oceans stay warm and your ground temperature stays warm because it's too dry. So what you begin to see is this, you hate to call it a positive feedback, but a positive feedback is one that actually accelerates a process. Whether it's mm -hmm. drinking too much or eating too much, the positive output of putting more food into your body makes you heavier. The positive output of putting more alcohol in your body makes you drunk. The positive output of putting more heat into a landmass makes it warmer. The result is a changing, warmer climate. So even though it has a negative connotation to it, that's what you call a positive feedback. Now, one thing we haven't seen yet, and that's a good thing, is any wildfires. Because, man, once we start to get into mid-July, late July, and you get a couple of thunderstorms with you know, lightning and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, now you're talking wildfire season. One of the things we saw last year was an actual warming of 
the middle part of the troposphere from about 18,000 to about 30,000 feet due to the persistence of the heat from the fires. Now, there can be a negative feedback from that, meaning if you have more smoke, then you're blocking out sunlight. So what you're doing is you may be warming the middle of the troposphere but cooling the top of the troposphere. Does that make sense to you? So what happens is so more smoke can actually block out. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because you will have a climate denier come out and say, oh, you said the atmosphere is going to warm up. But there's a report out, and I will cite it from the Journal of Atmospheric Science, that the upper troposphere cooled off after the fact that we had all these wildfires. So you're wrong about the atmosphere being warmer. But they'll do those sort of things. And that's what's called cherry picking. It has <laughs> nothing to do with the overall structure of the climate system. Uh, and speaking of that heat, uh, which is connected to drought, here's the uh, drought map released just a couple of mm -hmm. days ago. Um, last Thursday. Last Thursday. Which has changed probably since then. Without a doubt, Peg. Yeah, these, these, are, these, are, these are updated every Thursday because what they do mm -hmm. is they do a midweek um, synopsis. But go ahead, Mike. Oh, no, I, I, go ahead. I, but I, all I was going to say is it's odd how uh, – they update the map on Thursday, and that seems to be the day we get the rain uh, or start to get rain. So it's it's already out of date by the time they've released the map. Yeah, it seems that way. Now, people who do agricultural meteor meteor meteorology will probably know how to take rainfall estimates, not rainfall estimates, but rainfall analysis, and estimate what the next drought indicator will be. They could probably do that every 24 hours. I mean, that's pretty easy for them to do. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know how to do that, so I don't do that, but Peg's right, and I think there's actually a smaller map, which you can actually see, and this is interesting because this was even after we had the heavy rain move through Cook County, that parts of Lake and McHenry County and Kenosha and Walworth County were still under severe drought, yeah. and where I go up into southern Wisconsin um, every Sunday with Rebecca to see her horse, um, it's amazing how much drier it was up in southern Walworth County than it was even in northern Lake of McHenry County. I mean, it was terrible to the point where the farmers up there were cutting their, their alfalfa haylage and their grass ahead of time because they wanted to get that first cut in so they could bale the hay before it actually becomes almost unusable. So in a sense, in certain areas, we have all these horse farms the drought has affected them. Now, what they need to do is they probably need to go in there and probably just literally cut everything down to the nubs and then let literally this next rain kind of take over and hopefully that will um, infuse some, you know, some regrowth. And there's the, there's that, that map that you were that we were talking about. And even with the last seven days of rain, it actually has not been enough. Right. I would not be yeah. surprised if, yeah, if, right. if next Thursday the drought monitor map comes out and it's probably down to D2, which is severe drought. So even though like Waukegan Airport got about three and a half inches of rain, they were down about nine. So many yeah. of those areas that were severe drought uh, are probably still going to be down about five inches. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's this map uh, is, again, from last Thursday, so it's not going to contain any of the rain we had. But this is after we had the two inches on in my backyard on Sunday. And as you can see, there's still uh, extreme drought in uh, the northern part of our state and southern part of uh, Wisconsin. Peg, you were going to say something? Yeah, it just it kind of seemed like the further north you go in Lake County or the southern northeast Wisconsin counties, that the rain just kind of went around it. Yeah, yeah, it, and, and that's kind of like how sometimes droughts um, fester mm -hmm. themselves. It's like... It's like just the way that the weather kind of decided to drop its raindrops in a certain area is how it went. Now, that same map shows all of northern Iowa, southern Minnesota, which they're still in really, really dire straits. Most of the rain that's fallen has been from Des Moines southward. So last week we were talking about how the meteorologist on one of the Des Moines stations was talking about how much rain they need. Right. And that's really, that's really the map that you need to have in, in your brain. Um, they were showing anywhere between like 8 and 10 inches, and they've gotten maybe half of that. So it's those areas of, 
of northern Iowa, southern Minnesota, which is the third largest producer of corn in the United States. It goes Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota. So it's surprising that we have the Nebraska corn huskers, right? When we have more corn in three states before Nebraska, which is number four. Uh, but if you would look back at the map from a drought map from 2012, which was the last really, really bad drought we had, literally 50% of Illinois was under extreme drought by the time we got to the end of June. 2012 was much, much worse than 2021. And then you go back and look at the drought from 1988, when we had 47% of the country under severe drought. All of that was basically over the middle part of the country and all the way across the Corn Belt, which is one of the reasons why the drought of 1988. And I think, Mike, you were here. Peg, I know you were here. Yeah, yeah. But that, 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 that drought was not only a drought, but that was a heat wave. Yeah. And we, we, we got into that pattern in mid-May and didn't break until mid-August. We had 47 yeah, I remember days being of in the early hundreds. Yeah. And the low hundreds oh, yeah. a few times. Yeah. yeah, we had seven days above 100. In fact, yesterday, the high temperature, the record high temperature was 103 in 1988. And that was a $60 billion agricultural hit. If you take those mm -hmm. numbers and you equate them to 2021, that's $130 billion. This drought of 2021 is literally the Western United States. So it's not going to be that big of an issue from an agricultural standpoint. However, where it is going to be an issue is obviously some sort of hydroelectric concern for California, sport fishing, um, any sort of any sort of an, you know agricultural. I think California uses about forty percent of their water for agriculture, so it's really going to be a, a hit for California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho. Their number one concern when they get real hot is basically wildfires and things like that. Uh, so we'll see how this goes, but it does look like they'll probably cool off a little bit by the end of the week. But other than that, uh, you can't say more. You can't say enough about the rains that we've gotten. Mm -hmm. I like to use the word a million dollar rain. This was like a, probably a fifty million dollar rain for the state of Illinois. Really, that's uh, that's, oh, that's, yeah. that's that's quite quite amazing. As a matter of fact, I can pop up. All right, this is the uh, forty eight hour rainfall. Um, forecast yeah a forecast. forecast so this is the forecast yeah. uh so we still right. got but, more on the way and uh, uh what i've been meaning to ask you is what accounts for the, uh the uh southwest to northeast track of this is it have to do with that hot dome and where it's set up boundaries yeah and i and i meant to put in my morning report to you and when i was walking my dog i said to myself I didn't include the jet stream map because <laughs> that really yeah. tells the story. I knew you were going to ask me about that. So you have this big dome of literally a big area of high pressure that was over the southwest, and it moved up across the Great Basin and positioned itself over the Pacific Northwest. What it's doing is it's sending the air up and over the top, and it's kind of linking up with this trough down into mm -hmm. the middle of the United States. And Tropical Storm Claudette that came on shore last week um, in Louisiana brought a huge dome of warm tropical air into the southeast. So you now have a dome of warm air over the southeast, you have a dome of air over the Pacific Northwest, and in between you got that divot. And that divot is literally what's causing our weather to be somewhat unstable. Now, mm -hmm. we were I saw unstable, so I'll say unsettled. So we were unsettled yesterday, we'll be unsettled today, but if you look at the areas across Western and Northwestern Illinois, there was no rain. Literally from a line from DeKalb north to northeast of Rockford, no thunderstorms developed. Everything was literally along a very, very narrow corridor of southwest flow, and that corridor today has shifted to the east. So we're going to see this corridor rain today from St. Louis to Indianapolis, so we'll be fine. We may get a shower or a thunderstorm. We're not going to get the severe weather that we had yesterday. But then this corridor shifts northwest again. So we'll get back into this wet pattern during the day on Monday and into Tuesday. And that's why the seven-day rainfall forecast now shows an additional inch and a half. But you know what? Usually within like the 1.5 and the 1.5, where that little red is, you got yourself a two and a half to a three. 
So you can easily have another three inches develop in areas across, you know, the western and, you know, southern areas of the, of the Chicago metropolitan area. The problem, though, again... And is there a chance that would shift further north? That's, I knew you were going to ask that question, Big. The problem is it doesn't look like it's going to have enough to get it further north in the areas that need it. Uh, the only way I think we'll get probably some decent rains north is when the second front begins to push southward on Thursday, and that looks like it could be a nice soaking rain. So we still have a chance that we can get some decent rains on Thursday um, and into Friday. And I got a feeling the models may not pick up on pick up yet on that. Uh, but by the time we, we go into next weekend, we're going to be in a very cool pattern. Once again, big up a low to the north and east of us kind of drops back south. So we're in this kind of like, kind of like yin yang from the Pacific Northwest to the Great Lakes. And sometimes you get, can get stuck in those for about two or three weeks. What I'm concerned about is if that this trough over the Midwest becomes weaker and dislodges itself off to the east, the heat out west basically expands eastward. And we've seen that happen usually like mid-July, early August. I don't, I don't see that happening for us, though, because once you get stuck in these cool kind of cloudy, they kind of feed on themselves. Um, so we'll see how that transitions, but definitely temperatures over the next two weeks, nothing in the way of any hot and humid weather coming back at us anytime soon. Now, people will say yesterday was hot and yesterday was humid. Yeah, it was 83, but it wasn't 93. No. And the dew point was 74, which was really humid. Yeah. There's all of a sudden, you begin to get that, you begin to get that dew point sensitivity. It's like, okay, if the dew point 68, all of a sudden you'll go, wow, it's not that humid. But if the dew point went from 58 to 68, you'll go, where did this come from? Yeah. So it's amazing how quickly our bodies, you know, become attuned yeah. to 74 dew points. And not only is the dew point high, but the ground's beginning to evapotranspire mm -hmm. back into the atmosphere. And you'll feel that as well. So yeah. what's good about the rains is that they're really keeping the soil moist and it's going to really decrease the ability to the, for the ground to evaporate. So even if we didn't get a lot of rain, it's having an overall effect on keeping the heat out and then also the evaporation out as well. All right. We, uh, we need to take a short break here. Uh, one of, you know, in all this talk, we haven't even gotten to the tornadoes that hit the Chicago area on uh, Sunday, which is uh, pretty um, remarkable. And the yesterday. And, we had two and, events in, in six days. Yeah, so let's, let's, we'll talk about uh, tornadoes when we come back. That's meteorologist Rick DeMaio. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki, and we shall return. Okay, let's say you have a problem. It's Monday morning and your car won't start. What's the first step? Find out what's causing the problem. Or... Better yet, find someone who can. It's impossible to remedy an issue without first determining the cause. And when there's a problem with your tree or shrub, that's where Bartlett Tree Experts comes in. We call it plant analysis and diagnostics. We'll start by accurately identifying your tree. This is important because a tree species will indicate its typical traits and tolerances as well as any susceptibility to insects, disease, and other stress problems. Next, we'll look at the tree from the ground up. We'll check the condition of the soil, examine the root collar for decay or other issues, look at the color and health of the foliage, and inspect for damaging insects or disease. There's a lot to consider when making a correct diagnosis, and your local Bartlett Arborist has some unique support, a team of top scientists at the Bartlett Tree Research Laboratories. We can collect soil or plant samples from your tree and shrub and send it to our lab for analysis. Our lab analyzes over 20,000 of these samples each year, so you can count on an accurate diagnosis. Our lab also functions as an education center for our arborists to receive ongoing training. So after diagnosing your tree problem, we can also provide the most advanced arboricultural techniques and treatments to help solve it. Successful plant healthcare is all about timing and early detection. If something is concerning you about your trees or shrubs, don't hesitate to let us know. We're happy to help identify the trouble with our expert plant diagnostic services.
Whether you're a farmer or a backyard gardener, assist your soil in providing key nutrients to your plants with Spectrum Soil Inoculum from Tinyo Biologicals. The beneficial microorganisms in Spectrum break down and release vital nutrients and make them more accessible to your plants. Spectrum works with nature to decompose organic matter into humus, building richer, healthier soil. Spectrum is approved for use on certified organic crops and is OMRI listed. Get Spectrum at blazing-star.com. Time to win our hearts all in. Let's let the fun begin. Take a dive, take a dive, take a dive. I see a cloud and dive. I see a cloud and dive. I see a cloud and dive. Take a dive, take a dive, take a dive. I see a cloud and dive. I see a cloud and dive. You have the ability to give your soil a superpower. It's called composting. If you don't have a backyard, you need to contact Collected Resource Compost. CRC has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. They bring you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter from your kitchen, they swap it out and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectedresource.us. And welcome back uh, to the show. We were talking uh, before, uh, by the way, that's uh, meteorologist Rick DeMaio. And I just go- wanted to pass along a couple comments, Rick. Oh, okay. Because you're not seeing the stream. Um, Ernest out in Oregon says he really appreciates all the terrific information. I love how Rick pulls all the pieces together. Thanks. And Audrey says, Rick, I hope you know how much we really appreciate you. Well, they both read it just like I emailed it to them. That was terrific. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I can't, I can't find the script you sent me, nor the twenty dollar bill with it. Uh, they seem to have disappeared, it's Rick. Here, <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, By the know. way, uh, Peg, have you dipped your feet in Lake Michigan recently? I had my fingers in Lake Michigan. Yeah. What did What did it feel like yesterday? Uh, I wasn't there yesterday, but warmer. You you you're a oh, regular yeah. vis- visitor, Rick, aren't you? Yeah. Um, it was, I'm not kidding you, the shoreline water temperature at Lee Street Beach yesterday was 58 degrees. Yeah, westerly, the westerly going over. Southwesterly flow. It was unbelievably cold. And mm-hmm. I was not prepared for that because I was thinking, I'm riding my bike. I'm going to get nice and sweaty. I wasn't able to ride my bike, but I got down there and I was about to go in. And some guy goes, It's really cold. I'm like, Yeah, it's probably cooled off with the upwelling. It was freezing. I cannot oh, yeah. believe what it was. And I remember, was like- yeah, a few years ago, it was the same thing. It was so warm. You wanted to just go in the lake, and it was in the 50s. Right. Because right. the yeah. westerlies had just moved that surface water. Yeah, and, and, and it was really amazing because what we have, I think we had a couple of days where it was close to 70 degrees. So I was looking at water temperatures in the Pacific Northwest for people to mm-hmm. cool off. Now, we all know that the Pacific Ocean along the Oregon and Washington coast never really gets above 60 degrees. You guys want to take a guess at what the water temperature is in Puget Sound for people who want to jump off their houseboats? <laughs> uh, it's, I, don't, I don't have any idea. Pretty cold. Yeah, that's what I would guess. 48 degrees. Wow. 48 degrees. Yeah. It, it, it's so, the, na- <coughs> the, the weather service in Seattle said warm weather – does not equal warm water because what they were thinking was that these people were probably like jumping off and going in and all of a sudden going, Oh my God, I never realized how cold it is. But the weird thing is most people know that the ocean's cold, but you would think the water in the Puget sound would be warmer, but it's not. And I was kind of shocked by that as well. I thought at least it'd be a little bit warmer. So maybe it's because the currents, I'm not too sure, but yeah. And I checked three different places. The northern, well, the central, and the southern Puget Sound. 
uh, Robert. That's a lots of times where boaters get into trouble because it's a warm day. They go out, might be underdressed um, or not have a jacket or something, wind up in the water. And because it's been days of westerly, it's super, super cold. Yeah. Or they've had a couple, they're you know, and then they're going, I'm going to go for a swim. And next thing you know, their body literally goes into shock. Uh, and they drown. But yeah, so just word to the wise, anybody who wants to go down to the lovely beaches here from Lake Forest down to Rainbow Beach, be prepared for some really, really chilly water. Well, Robert uh, Boyce <laughs> writes, he says, cold today. I don't know what it means because he's jumped in himself or he's just commenting on what you guys are saying. Uh, well, let me show you something uh, that uh, I got a hold of and I think you'll find interesting. Um, Ooh. Yes. 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 That is from That's our the buddy. the wrong place to grow a tree. Yeah, I know it. That's our buddy. That's from Skeet. That's from Skeet. Our buddy Skeet, who works for uh, Bartlett Tree Experts. Uh, of course, full disclosure, they are our uh, main sponsor on the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Um, and um, this is his territory. He's in the Bolingbrook office. Okay, so he sent me. He it must be two dozen photographs of uh, lots of things like that and like this look at that uh, just top of that tree just kind of sheared off wait till you see this one um oh wow that's tornado damage there or or some sort of you know wind damage but that yeah the, the i think this was that, tornado, yeah. his tornado cleanup photos yeah this yeah. is this is that's what i mean he's in bolingbrook so his territory covered woodridge and uh neighborville where this uh, all happened I mean, that, I think this is the, another view of that other tree we saw first that looks like somebody tried to plant it in the driveway. Um, yeah, what, what, look, what looks weird about that, Mike and Peg, is it almost looks like the root ball stayed intact and the tree got yeah. ripped out of the root ball. I wonder if that was, I wonder if that was diseased. I, well, what Skeet wrote in some cases, sorry, Mike, what Skeet wrote was some of these trees were twisted off. Oh, right. right. Yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. And because and, and because the ground prior to the tornado event uh, was so dry, as evident from the you know the brown grass, yeah. when you have really really dry ground, the the tree can't lift the entire root ball out, so it'll literally twist and then crack off. And uh, Skeet's going to be with us next week uh, on the fourth of July uh, to talk about this, the storm damage, what he's encountered. He says it's just been horrific. Uh, out there and if you there have been articles uh, i saw one in the trib the other day about how it's just changing people's lives because they went from a yeah. completely wooded area to nothing those trees just yeah. disappeared i was driving on 55 355 south uh a few uh it was uh monday after the storm and i saw oh, wow. the one of the highway signs down and yeah. it, it was the highway sign to Woodridge, ironically. Yeah. And I thought, uh-oh, I wonder if that had anything to do with it. And then, of course, I noticed all the leaf litter on the highway, which you're normally not going to see on, right. on, on, on a tollway. Yeah, and it was and all over the place. the tornado was, like, right there, right by 355. Yeah, yeah it, like 355 and um, um, 75th Street. And here's one mm -hmm. that got rooted up and just tipped over. So this is a, we'll be showing some more of those uh, next week because that's just an example of the kind of damage that uh, Skeet saw out that way. And so he's, uh, he's earning his keep this week. Um, so let's talk about those storms and the ones yesterday. Uh, the, uh, the ones, uh, how many, you said we had a couple tornadoes yesterday, right? Yeah, there was there was one down at uh, Chatsworth and one down in Crete. Um, I think they're probably going to end up rating them F zero. Uh, and the reason why yesterday's tornadoes were not as bad is because the wind profile, the vertical wind profile from the surface, from the surface on up to about um, eighteen thousand feet, was literally the same. So you had at the surface winds of like. 220, 230 degrees. And if you go all the way up to about 18 to 20,000 feet, the wind direction was almost exactly the same. That means that there was no directional change mm -hmm. in your just vertical Just a strong wind. southwest the whole way. Right just, a, right, just a strong southwest. The best way to get rotation 
is to have a vertical change in your direction, meaning that you have like a south-southeast wind, like a 140 to a 160 at the surface, a south wind at like five to 10,000 feet, and a southwest wind from 10 to 18,000 feet. We had that profile, the directional change last Sunday night. Yesterday, we didn't have the directional change. Now, the atmosphere- and can, can I interrupt real quick, Rick? Yeah, go ahead. So for our, yeah. for our viewers, listeners who might not be aware of what you mean when you say uh, 130, 230? Oh, I'll explain that. That's the direction that the wind is coming from, okay? So 130 is 130 degrees. That would be like, say, uh, 4 o'clock on a mm -hmm. clock. So it would be coming from 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock. And then as you go further up in the atmosphere, right, if you go further up in the atmosphere, it's coming from the southwest. So to get rotation, you want a southeast wind with a southwest wind and then a west wind. We had that on Thursday. I mean, not on Thursday, last Sunday. But the storms came through at midnight. So the amount of instability that you had in the atmosphere from a thermodynamic perspective was not that great. It was actually quite low. Yesterday, the thermodynamic instability of the atmosphere was much greater than what it was last Sunday night. But the shear was zero from a standpoint of directional shear. So we had actually a better setup from a standpoint of wind on Sunday night, yet we had a better setup from a standpoint of thermodynamics yesterday, which is one of the reasons why we got more rain yesterday. It covered a larger area. But Mike and Peg, if we would have had anything more than like a south-southeast wind with that westerly or southwesterly wind aloft yesterday, I guarantee you we would have had a repeat performance of what we had back in 2013 when we had that F4 move through Washington, Illinois. All the signs were there. All the signs were there. Yeah, I, uh, uh, it's, it's odd watching uh, the TV and seeing those lines and feeling the, the, the dew point, how high it is and how muggy it is. And, and you know, <laughs> oh, my goodness, if we get some... Uh, opposite direction down there and they kept saying we think this rotation is starting here and it never right, amounted right. to anything or very yeah, little and, and what, yeah and what what happens is you'll get the rotation from the base of the cloud which is probably about two or three thousand feet off the ground up to about ten thousand feet but to really get that rotation all the way down to the surface you really need somewhat of a southeasterly wind so it takes it so in an odd way, a tornado starts up here and actually works its way down to the ground. And it's working its way down to the ground with the wind actually being sucked up into the cloud. So it's almost like an optical illusion. It's really weird. So while the air is going up, the funnel is actually forming down to the ground. It, it's kind of weird to kind of put all that into perspective. And trust me, everything was there except that last 2,000 feet. Now, what you never want to do as a TV weathercaster is cheerlead these things. And I've done that before. You, what, sometimes you'll say, what, you want, what we want to see is this. And all of a sudden, you catch yourself going, no, but we don't want to see that. <laughs> yeah. But you, you kind of like you're going, I think there's something here. I think there's something here. And you got to be really careful about going, this is where it's happening. The problem with yesterday and then also on, on Sunday is they were moving so fast. So a polygon goes out, it starts out here, 15 minutes later it's here, mm -hmm. and then by the time the word, the word gets out, the storm's already gone. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, so, go ahead, now, Kevin. I saw I think, on Friday, I was getting things, I was getting weather warnings on my phone Friday of conditions favorable for funnel clouds forming, but they wouldn't hit the ground. Which I, I don't yeah. recall ever getting that warning on my phone before. Yeah, I, I, I kind of got to go back and, and look at that. But I, I think there was um, something, again, where we had enough in the way of, of dynamic instability, but not enough moisture where you were actually going to be able to get rain coming down to the surface. So we went from, I think, mid 60 dew points on Friday to like low to mid 70 dew points on Saturday. 
So mm -hmm. oftentimes when you begin to build up these clouds and someone says, does a cloud have weight? Actually, your standard cumulonimbus that produces a thunderstorm could easily weigh 500 tons. It's amazing. I mean, all that and you go, moisture. You go, you go, right, all that, all that liquid has got to come down to the ground, but what's holding it up is the fact that there's enough buoyancy in the atmosphere where the rain hasn't started forming those big drops. We call that the coalescence process. And once they begin to come down to the ground, you literally take that cool air and it rushes it down to the surface. Now, if you noticed yesterday, there really wasn't a lot of lightning and thunder. Did you guys no. notice that? There really yeah, wasn't. I did notice that. Yeah, that's because these storms were literally reaching their full potential by the time they got to about 25 to about 30,000 feet. Normally, your supercell thunderstorms during the springtime when the atmosphere is much colder, you'll have a lot of lightning. But because this was almost acting like a northern Gulf of Mexico, northern Florida type of environment, the dew mm -hmm. points were so high, the freezing level was up to probably about 14 or 15,000 feet. So because the atmosphere wasn't super cold here, the charges had to go really way up high to generate, you know, electricity. When the atmosphere is much colder, the charge separation goes like this, as opposed to like this. Uh -huh. And they were never getting up to that point, which is why you weren't getting the lightning, which is why you weren't getting the thunder. And because it was so warm and so wet, notice there was no hail, zero hail in this kind of environment. So oftentimes in the springtime, you'll get a lot more thunder and lightning and a lot more hail. This was a non-hail producer. This was almost acting like a, like a, a northern Gulf of Mexico, southern, um, go, southern Florida type, southeast United mm -hmm. States thunderstorm complex with the dynamics of the Great Lakes. Wow. It was, it was very odd. And if, you, and if you remember, this stuff was literally developing at like 1130 in the morning. It yeah. wasn't waiting until Matt. Yeah. No, and and uh, I, I'm so glad you explained that because I was kind of uh, uh, interested in why there wasn't more thunder and lightning, but um, yeah. and I didn't realize that there was a different character to the storms in the Gulf as opposed to the Midwest. When you're in the Midwest, you see that coming in, you expect thunder, lightning, uh, hail, uh, and yet, uh, yeah. the, and considering how soupy everything was out there. We, it was surprising that we didn't get it. Yeah, now, now the event that came through on Sunday night, that was all predicated by a fast-moving area low pressure and a strong cold front. So the, the, the cooling down, if you remember, the backside of those thunderstorms, there was a lot of lightning. I mean, it was just nonstop lightning, mm -hmm. amount of cloud to the ground. Light. If you remember, the next day, we had temperatures barely hit 70. And Tuesday morning, we got down to the 40s. I mean, that Rick, actually... can you turn your audio, can you turn your video off, Rick? <clears throat> uh, you're, um, you're breaking up here a little bit. Breaking up a lot. Okay, so, there you go. Oh, the video's off. All right. Can you guys hear me all right? Yep, we can hear you yeah. just fine. There we go. Okay. All right, so the bottom line was um, the event that came through month, Sunday night acted like mm -hmm. midday. The event that came through... Yesterday acted almost like early August. <laughs> that's uh, that's wow. amazing. All right. Well, we're going to uh, be getting to the forecast here. I'm going to pop something up. I don't know if you can see this uh, at the moment. Uh, this is a... Yep, I can. Okay. So this is the Sunday forecast map for... Yeah, so yeah this, this is for today. So basically the front that was just west of us this morning should line up. Um, east of us, so from Fort Wayne down to about, uh, what, maybe south of Champaign. That's where the mm -hmm. thunderstorm activity is going to be today. So we're fine today. It'll still be humid. Um, we'll still see these clouds over us, but I would not be surprised if we get zero rain today. And then if you look at tomorrow's map, tomorrow's map shows that wave to the south of us literally beginning to jump back northward, and that's when you'll begin to see on your – you know, your smartphones and your iPhones, uh, rain redeveloping across western Illinois. That's going to be in here probably by tomorrow morning. And then on Tuesday, the system is completely, literally, like right over northern Illinois. Um, this, is the, this is the seven day for uh, next week. Yeah, you went, all, you, you went all the way to next Saturday, which is fine. Yeah, we don't have uh, them all here. 
That's, that's fine. That's fine. I, I know what they are in my brain, and I'll try to explain it. <laughs> but on Tuesday, on Tuesday, that system on Monday is going to be right over us, and then should be east of us by Wednesday, and then Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, which you can see the forecaster is calm. Don't you love that name? Um, uh, that's all going to push south. So we're going to get wet again, one and a half to two and a half inches of rain beginning tomorrow uh, into Wednesday. And then again, that, that Thursday time frame is when we could see our transition from very, very humid conditions to cool, humid conditions. I don't think Thursday or Friday are going to be very nice days, but it definitely gives us a chance to dry out. So next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, uh, much, much drier, and hopefully we'll be talking about beneficial rain. But what you see happening across the southeast, tremendous mm -hmm. amounts of rain. Uh, and again, in the areas in the deep south where they don't need it. Um, and we'll see how long the heat goes on yeah. across parts of California, Oregon, and Washington. Again, what everybody is waiting for right now is that first lightning strike. Because instead of talking about the heat, they'll be talking about wildfires. And you hate to say it, but it's inevitable that it's going to happen, and it's going to be bad. And I'm looking at the the seven day next week. This map, um, and I'm sure people in the Pacific Northwest want this to happen soon. Is a couple of low pressure areas up there to just change that. So that dome is that the the big high pressure that comes over into the Midwest. Um, well, got to be careful about this. Okay, heat waves start out in the middle level of the atmosphere, and they push down. So what happens is you get really hot at the surface, and because you get really hot, the air becomes less dense. So underneath these big hot domes in the mid and upper level atmosphere, at the surface, you actually have an area of low pressure. It's called the thermal low. Okay. So the low pressure at the surface means that the air is basically so warm that it has less pressure. The reason why it's so hot is because the high pressure aloft is pushing the air down, the air may only have about 5,000 feet to warm up. If you begin to increase the column of that air, the heat is allowed to expand. That's one of the reasons why high pressure systems aloft create hot weather at the surface. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, it, it, it does. Um, in fact, Dan Costa is saying he's learning a lot today. And Ernest out in um, Portland says it's just before 9 o'clock here and it's already 84. <laughs> That's really warm. Yeah. And, you know, they, they actually had the Olympic track and field competition in Eugene, Washington yesterday, and it probably ended up being who can sweat the least. I mean, I don't know why you would continue to do that in Eugene, Washington, at Eugene, Oregon. Um, that that's probably was not good thinking on, well, I, I mean, and Eugene, Oregon would be cool in the end of June, but um, I feel really bad for the athletes trying to run in that weather. Yeah. That was, that was, that was pretty brutal. Well, what, what's also very brutal right now is your signal coming from uh, your uh, computer. So uh, we're for some reason, it just uh, about five minutes ago decided to tank, um, and those things happened. So, uh, but you gave us our forecast. We know we're going to get a little more rain, and then it's going to cool off, or rather uh, dry out uh, later in the week. Uh, anything else you want to add before we let you go? No, I, I think our, our focus next week should be on you know, agriculture, uh, because once you get into the second week of July, you begin to get into the pollination of your corn. Uh, so we can talk more about that and whether or not, you know, whether or not what I said before about hay in certain parts of the Midwest um, is prevalent. I think they got their first cut in already. We'll see how this is affecting their second cut. And that always has an impact uh, also on people who own horses and whether or not they got to pay more money to get bring hay in from, you know, from outside the area. So we can focus more on, on agriculture next week. All right. That sounds great. Okay. Uh, thanks. This has been fantastic. I think uh, uh, our uh, viewers are uh, very happy that uh, you gave them the uh, the extra time to talk about yeah. these developments. Although we didn't really actually uh, investigate just how many tornadoes, how many tornadoes came down uh, at the beginning of the week? Uh, uh, three, three confirmed on... Um, Sunday night, uh, EF0, EF1, and then EF3. And the EF3 was literally about a block long. That was it, really small. But what's really amazing is that the path length of that tornado, the Naperville Woodridge Darien tornado, was 16 miles. The path length of the Plainfield tornado was 16.5 miles. 
Mm. The width of the playing field tornado was a quarter mile. The width of this tornado was a third of a mile. They were almost exactly the same distance and length, but clearly the playing for playing field tornado was much, much worse. If you look at the population of southern DuPage and northern Will County over the last 30 years, it's probably grown over a half million easily. So you start bringing EF3 tornadoes into one of the fastest growing areas suburban-wise in the United States, and all of a sudden everybody gets concerned about them, everybody worries about them, and everybody thinks twice about what happens when a siren goes off. Yeah. What we still need quickly, guys, is not only when the siren goes off, and Mike, I want you to get on this because you have connections to the city of Chicago. Yeah, we, okay. still need a siren. we still need a siren that has the all clear. We don't have that. All we ah. do is go, woo, woo, woo. but we don't have all clear, all clear, all clear. We don't have that. That's uh, an excellent point. I had never. As opposed to when it just stops and people. Yeah. Right, right, Peg. Yeah. No one knows. I mean, what do you do? What are you going to say? Alexa, is it all clear? We are all clear. <laughs> <laughs> there uh, okay all right rick with that note uh you have a great week we'll talk to you on the fourth of july sounds good guys all right take care uh that's a that's a shame that uh, the signal just uh, and that wasn't us this time by the way our other our our own signal uh held very strong uh this week because um i uh, i started playing with uh well, I got a new router and and a, and, ah. a, and a new modem, and yeah, we found out it's a lot of it. Ha it's it still we were right. It was a Comcast issue, so uh, that's we're fixing the Comcast issue. See, when All we're right. done with the show, we then spent the next hour troubleshooting. I know that's what we do. I don't know if we're <laughs> going to do that this week. We're just going to uh, put the theme on and thank everybody who was on the show today. Um, boy, that was fun to have Nancy Lawson. Here's her book. The Humane Gardener, pick it up. And uh, Janet Crouch, her sister, what a great story about beating the HOA. Thanks to uh, meteorologist Rick DeMaio for uh, uh, another deep green dive, this time into weather and climate. Uh, thanks to Legata. I have, I've set up Legata Cam. It's going to happen soon, all right? Ah. Uh, and uh, Basil the dog. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, upstairs, and for warming my coffee and everything else. Until next time, until the 4th of July, go green or go home. Uh, Stadler? Yeah, uh, what? Is that it? Yes, it's over. How'd you like it? I don't know. I slept through the whole thing. Well, you didn't miss much. <laughs>